I see Joan. Oh, I'll unmute everybody. Hi, I'm, I'm on my iPad. I, I couldn't get on my computer. It wasn't you or it your, was computer. your computer. There was a link problem. There was a link problem. Yes. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll just stay on my iPad. Oh, okay. you're great. You can see me, right? Yes. Absolutely. And hear you. And hear me. So we've got, <laughs> so who was, who else? Um, the. Bell Ann. Bell Ann. Okay. I can probably email Bell Ann and I can email. Stan. George. Oh, Dan, I can George. Slack. Stan. Dan. Stan Holland. Oh, not Dan Wilkinson. No. Mm. Okay. All right. Okay, now we're, by the if way, we are live on Facebook. Andrew, to make it more fun, unable yep. to live stream to the custom service. Oh, no, no, it is. Um, it's working. It, okay. you, always get that, you always get that note. So can I close that note? Yes, yep, close the note. Okay. <laughs> You are you are live. We are live on Facebook. Hello, Facebook. Hello, and, Facebook. And we are live on our website. Okay. Yep. Terrific. There you. Unable yep. to live stream to the customer. Yep. Yeah. Wait, I just. Yep. You're on. You're on our website as well. So we're all good. Wonderful. Wonderful. Okay. So and everyone can now see it. Thank you yeah. for all your assistance. <laughs> Can everyone see each other? Are we all working on that? Judith, I can um, see. I'm on my iPad, so I can't see too many people at one time. Okay. I can see four at one time, but I can keep shifting it. Okay. Yeah, I can only see four on my iPad. Okay. okay. I can see eight, but Judith's pad, iPad, I cannot see. Yeah, Judith, you don't have your video on. Can I turn it on for you? Well, she's I've never sound on either, so she can't answer me. So there we go. I will turn on both. If I can. Yeah. Unmute. You can only ask her to start the video? Yeah, it's not even letting me unmute her. Same. Okay. Judith, if you can hear us, great. If you can't, you might want to call in using a phone number. This looks like Nadine. What, what was the password? And I'll try my computer Hi, again. Hi, Nadine. Hi, Joan, Nadine. the best way is just to click on the link from your computer, your email. I, I, I don't have a link to my computer. I have to plug it in. Oh, OK. The, you know what? We're streaming now live, so I don't want to read the password. Never mind. OK. <laughs> Sorry about that. Hi, Never Nadine. mind. I'm glad you're able to join us. <laughs> Good to see you. So once again, I apologize to everyone um, and to those on Zoom and to those on Facebook and everything. We had a confusion of links and we apologize for that. And so we are starting obviously late. Um, and so if it's okay with everyone, and we are going, will it be okay if we go a little long to make up for the starting late? Okay. We you know what? Thank I'm, you. And I'm going to go. Yes. Judy, Judy Lerner can hear and she prefers to listen. So she's set. Fantastic. Okay. Terrific. Bye bye, thank everyone. You. I'm going back thank to Copenhagen. You, yes. Enjoy. Okay. So we're, I'm so glad all of you are here. Um, and hopefully Carol will be able to join us because she was going to take care of something and come back. So hopefully she will be able to join us. Um, at one point it, it was she and I on a different site, which was the one that I was expecting everyone on. So it's nice to see more of you now. Um, okay. Switching gears. <sighs> <laughs> Taking a deep breath. Right? Yeah. Letting I don't it all go. Know. I don't know how you stay as cool as a cucumber through an outage. I did that for decades and I was a nervous wreck. It never went away. <laughs> uh, lots of work. Lots of work. Okay. 
Um, oh, and here's Carol. Yay. Okay. So we are now approaching Song of Songs. Um, thank you for going on this journey with me all these weeks. Carol, I'm so glad you got to join us. Um, I had trouble. I had to call Bob again. I well, I'm glad. Again. I'm so glad you're with us. Okay. So we are in Song of Songs. So we have finished four weeks of exploring I it and I thou relationships in various ways in Genesis. And all of that is important as it leads up to this today. Um, I'm going to do some introduction and then I will share my screen and we will um, have the pleasure of looking at various parts of Song of Songs. And here we go. Okay, so Song of Songs has a couple other names as well. Um, it is called Song of Songs. Susan, I'm sorry to interrupt. Do we do a bracha before we study? Thank you. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam Asher Kitshanu Bumitzvamtah Vitzivanu Lasok Bidivrei Torah. And really to dwell and to soak in and bathe in this book is just glorious. So thank you, George, because that's very important. Um, so it's called Song of Songs. It is also called Song of Solomon. Although probably he did not write this. Um, it is called the Song of Many Songs. And it is also viewed on a different way uh, as the most excellent of songs. So song of songs can mean both it's a song of many, or it could be it's actually a song of many songs, that it has many songs within it, or it could be that it was the most excellent of songs. So like, you know, like being the apple of the apples or whatever it may be, this is the song of all the songs. Um, it is definitely love poetry. Some would consider it erotic love poetry. Marsha Falk um, says that there is no structural unity to the compilation. And she believes that it's just a compilation of lyrical love poems. And that there are, and that it may not be just one couple that it's talking about, but it may be many couples, many couples, different love stories. Um, most, however, believe that it's one story <clears throat> between two lovers. Um, and it's a very exciting stuff. So I mentioned before, it's called the Song of Solomon, although probably Solomon did not write it. It's attributed to Solomon. Um, it's believed that that attribution was probably edited in later was inserted later um, that, and was inserted either to give him credit or to say that it was inspired by Solomon. Um, and some would say that perhaps it was inspired because Solomon was certainly known to have many, many wives um, and many foreign wives and that therefore maybe he was an inspiration in that respect for it. Um, or it's viewed that Solomon is mentioned because Solomon obviously was, I shouldn't say obviously, Solomon is known for him, and much of the literature around that are attributed to Solomon is what's called wisdom literature. And so perhaps it was done to tie this, this book with all the wisdom literature that was in um, primarily in the writings. Mm -hmm. So that is one thing. Um, and yet, here's, I think, some of the cooler parts. The woman's voice in this, story, in this book, A, we get to hear a woman's thoughts, which we generally don't get to do. Um, and B, the woman talks way more than the man does. So some believe that it might have been a female author, which is kind of interesting. 
um, whoever it was, was familiar with patrician culture for living in the palace, which is one of the reasons why I chose my palace today. This is Windsor Castle um, <laughs> and the gardens of Windsor Castle, which is another reason why I chose it was for the gardens. Um, so we have, we have that. And some say that maybe the author might have been one of Solomon's foreign wives because of knowing the palace, because of Solomon, because of the language that's used and because of the way um, the female is described. Some of these verses are more archaic in grammar and linguistics. And much of it, however, is newer. And yet at the same time, it's hard to date when this was written because lyrical compositions are hard to date. It's much easier to date when it's prose. And the other joy of it is it's timeless. So it becomes much harder to date because of that as well. Um, some say it may be a response later to restricted times of social, when they tried to restrict social relations, whether it be ethnic or class or geographically. Um, and there's a lot of cool things that are going on there with this. Now, Carol Myers, when she analyzed the gender imagery that's used here, she said that this is a single biblical book that has preserved this non-public world, because we'll see it's very private, intimate scenes, and allows us to see the private realm that dominated the social landscape for, um, for much of ancient Israel's population. And that the female realm was really, and the female power was really in the domestic realm. And so that that's why we see more female power in this one. Um, and yet O'Connor's suggests that not sure that it was really private realm because of some of the actual things that we see in this piece, but that all of it is, and would suggest that this is part of the wisdom literature. Um, so that as we look at this today, one should know that there were real questions of whether this should even be put into the Tanakh there were great debates when they were editing the whole thing. And that um, some say that the woman in this story represents wisdom. So that it's not necessarily about a man and a woman, but more humans in a relationship with knowledge, with wisdom. Or Torah. Uh, wisdom or Torah, yes. And so that relationship. Um, and tying it in with Proverbs. And then others would say that um, it's really about Israel being the female in this couple and God being the male of this couple. So that I have a quote for you here from Arthur Waskow that says in about 120 CE, the Common Era, as the rabbis of the Sanhedrin voted to include the song in the canon of sacred texts, they transformed the song from an erotic poem sung in halls and beloved by the people into a spiritualized allegory, fit mainly for mystics, in which the lovers are understood as Israel and God. There would be a spiritual symmetry as well as an irony if the song became for our own generations an important lesson for sexual ethics and practice in a new ethos in which pleasure and joy will simultaneously earthy and spiritual, an ethos in which we saw the absence of God's name in the song as an invitation to sense God as present throughout the song, not in one of its particular characters, but in its every breath of the song's music in all its forms and content. So we're gonna be exploring, as we look at this, we're gonna be exploring the relationship of the two people, whether it's I, it, or I, thou, 
we will be exploring if it's an I eternal, and at the same time, we're going to be exploring if it's an I eternal thou, eternal thou being God, and where is God in this story? Um, and that we're looking here at mutual courting, mutual attraction, mutual admiration, um, and we're going to explore what that might all mean. So now I can share my screen. Any questions? before I share. Okay, as I share, remember that I can't necessarily see everyone. So if someone could maybe Sherry or Lois, if one of you could keep an eye on everyone and just speak up if there are questions. Sure. Okay, thank you. Sharing the screen. <laughs> Hopefully we will have no more technical issues. Okay. <laughs> the temple. Everyone see the temple? That's sent mail. Okay. <laughs> I'm sure you wanted to see all of that. <laughs> I was about to send everyone an email when we were having these issues. So that's why that was up. Okay. <laughs> okay. So part five, we're going to start by exploring the very beginning. Can you, it's kind of blurry. Oh. Oh, I don't know if I can fix that. It's, no, it's, no, it's, it's fine. Good now. Now it's fine? Okay, great. Yeah, One, it's good. Cool. Okay, so as you can see when I said it's also called the Song of Solomon, mm -hmm. verse one says right here, the Song of Songs by Solomon. So that was the part that's believed was added later, or it might've been added at the time. We don't know, we weren't there. Um, but here we go. Okay, so it gets fun even at the very beginning. Oh, give me of the kisses of your mouth, for your love is more delightful than wine. Your ornaments yield a sweet fragrance. Your name is like finest oil. Therefore, do maidens love you. Draw me after you, let us run. The king has brought me to his chambers. Let us delight and rejoice in your love savoring it more than wine, like new wine, they love you. So how are we feeling so far? Thirsty for wine. <laughs> have a whole different translation, at least in verse one. If I may share. Please, wait, first share with us whose translation you have. I have the Art Scroll, the stone edition of Art Scroll. Okay. And verse one says, the song that excels all songs, which you pointed out to, uh, dedicated to God, him, and that's the translation, to whom peace belongs. Okay, so all I can tell you is, if you look at the Hebrew, that is not there. Now, the first part certainly could be, as I discussed before, but it, the Hebrew is shir hashirim, asher l'shlomo. Does that really go to the credibility? In other words, if this is allegedly attributed to Solomon, mm -hmm. that would then be the credibility to get it into the biblical canon? Um, when they debated whether it should go in or not, they had major debates and Rabbi Akiva actually was the one who got it to be in. And the concept that made it go in was they believed, as I said, that it was, um, allegory for a relationship between that that the female in this is Israel and that the male in this is God. Thank you. That's how they did that. Um, art scroll is definitely an orthodox document. Um, and yet I still find it very interesting because this is generally known as either a text like, like the scroll of Esther, they are the only two 
books in the entire Torah, in the entire Tanakh, that are known for God being absent in them. Um, and yet in the scroll of Esther, there's a sense of God in there without God ever being mentioned. As we look at this text, especially as we finish this text, uh, there is a possibility that God is in one tiny part of it, which I love. Um, and that will be something that we will highlight at the end. Um, but otherwise, either God is not in here at all, or God is in that relationship, or God is in the entire thing, as was said, that God may be in the entire thing because of the relationship that it is. So if we talk about God being um, a sense of love, or God being in when you have an I thou moment, or if God being in there when two people really love each other, um, or if God is love, then God is here. But that word is definitely Asher Le Shlomo. There's the, God's name is certainly not in that first verse. So thank um, you George, for asking that question. Um, there are lots of cool translations and we're gonna, when I get to the one verse that I'm talking about in terms of God, we will look at many different translations. But I can tell you throughout, obviously, some do it more beautifully than others. This is, I do not know who Safaria uses. I think it's JPS in their translation, but I am not 100% sure. Yes. Susan? Yes. Susan? Um, I don't quite understand where it says, the king has brought me to his chambers. Let us delight and rejoice in your love. Who, okay. There's more than one person involved. Um, it's well, four. It's four. It's four. yes, I see where you are. Um, it could be if we go with the idea that this is one of Solomon's wives who wrote this, she may be describing, and it's a she who's speaking through this one, um, this whole section is in feminine terms talking. Um, it could be that she is talking about that she and the king are this relationship. So the we could be she and the king. <clears throat> if it is talking about a different couple, if it's talking about she and someone else, <laughs> then it becomes much more interesting what in the world they're trying to say right here. And there are lots of questionable statements throughout this whole thing. And I will tell you that as we go through this, there are passages that we have no clue which of the two people are talking. Mm. Um, and uh, there are lots of things that are unclear. And I love that about this text. Because sometimes, because when we're like in the midst of the beginning of love, you know, that new love, that new wine, that early love, things are like, we're so focused on different things that like, you can't tell the end of yourself and the next person and, and all of those types of things. And I think they're playing with all of that in this poetry. Susan, just to interrupt, I've lost my video, even though you can see me like last night. So could uh, Lois please call on people if need be? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry that's happening, Sherry. Me too. <laughs> Makes it very hard to see the screen, obviously. <laughs> yes. um, okay. So are there any more questions before I move on? Okay. I will take that as uh, I can move on. So the next several verses, the woman is still talking. Although it goes back and forth some and it's harder to follow already. And it, she, says to, she says, I am dark but comely. O daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar, like the pavilions of Solomon. So here, there is some question of whether she is a person of color. Mm. 
why she is insulting herself, I do not know. Um, although many of us do, and it's a question of is she questioning <laughs> why is he in love with me and not someone else? Oh, now I'm oh, now myself. myself. Are other people having technical audio? No. It, it nope. skipped for a moment, but it's just fine now. Okay, great. Okay, so she continues. Don't stare at me because I am swarthy. So she's still insulting herself. Because the sun has gazed upon me. My mother's sons quarreled with me. They made me guard the vineyards. My own vineyard I did not guard. So here we're dealing with, do we, so when we studied Tamar, not Tamar, when we studied the rape of Dina, when we talked about the brothers, this, uh, this ties in with that, because once again, we have the brothers being possessive of her, right. and whether the vineyards are real vineyards, or whether the vineyards are her... Um, virginity, perhaps? We oh. do not know. So then it continues. Tell me, you whom I love so well, where do you pastor your sheep? Where do you rest them at noon? Let me not be as one who strays besides the flocks of your fellows. So she's asking her lover, where can I find you? I don't want to just go around all the places that all the shepherds do their thing. How do I find you? Where do I find you at a given time? If you do not know, O oh, fairest of women, so while she sees herself as comely, her lover is already calling her the fairest of women, go follow the tracks of the sheep and graze your kids by the tents of the shepherds. I have likened you, my darling, to a mare in Pharaoh's chariots. Hmm. Your cheeks, so how many of you think your partner would love to be compared <laughs> to Pharaoh's chariots? I don't think so. <laughs> so. So in this case, so while I talked about it being timely, I'm, you know, timeless, there are certain comparisons, like, to being compared to a horse in, in Pharaoh's chariots. Most people would not love that one that much, although a mare in, in Pharaoh's chariots is probably very strong and very muscular, but generally most people would not want to be compared to a horse, although we do sometimes still compare people to stallions. Um, your cheeks are comely with plated wreaths your neck with strings of jewels. We will add wreaths of gold to your spangles of silver. So describing different body parts, and you'll see as we go through this, there's a tradition of either going from toe to head or from head to toe, mm. which is, you know, kind of nice to have your entire body being described bit by bit. <laughs> Unnecessarily. <laughs> Only if it's a supportive, loving way. It's not the, it's not, what does my tushy look like in this dress? It's not that. <laughs> okay. So we move on. While the king was on his couch. Oh, I've got couch, somebody from George? Yes. Again, uh, this is a translation. Yes. Um, if looking at uh, verse nine. It says going back, okay. Your verse nine. Yes. Um, it says, with my mighty steeds who battled Pharaoh's riders, I reveal that you are my beloved. So again, it's a different perhaps image and emphasis that um, the translator of um, these verses have, but could, it, could this be possibly authored by the Queen of Sheba, who was an Ethiopian woman? And so, <clears throat> as uh, I as I said, it could have been one of Solomon's wives. So, or could at least have been, who he had a relationship with. 
Right. So could it have been the Queen of Sheba? Maybe. We have no idea. We just know what the text says. There's lots of guesses in this. Right. They do not know. They do not know at this point. Um, and so if it's the Queen of Sheba, it's even more interesting, therefore, that it would be talking about Pharaoh. Um, and her skin color. Yes. Yes. So we don't know. We don't know. But, you know, so one, one you have beloved and this has my darling. And that's, you know, both are fine. I mean, I would say in this one, both translations make sense. In the other one, they were much more loose with their translation. Or trying to give it more, you know, it certainly sounds like trying to give it more clout that it's about God so that people feel comfortable um, with this document. Okay. Mm -hmm. Verses 12 through 17. While the king was on his couch, my nard gave fragrance. My myrrh. How's that for a comparison? A bag of myrrh lodged <laughs> between my breasts. My beloved to me is a spray of henna blooms. From the vineyards of Engedi. Engedi is really important because Engedi is this little middle of the desert yeah. near the Dead Sea and near Masada and has a waterfall and it's just a stunning place. Oh, you are fair, my darling. Oh, you are fair. You lost the text? No, it's back. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. It's okay now. <laughs> oh, you are fair, my darling. Oh, you are fair with your dove love, dove like eyes. And you, my beloved, are handsome, beautiful indeed. So we're going, you can hear the dialogue. It's going back and forth. And one's trying to in some way praise the other one. Our couch. So while the king is on his couch in the castle, we now get, and you, my beloved, are handsome, beautiful indeed. Our couch is in a pick, bower. Um, Susan, it is blurry. I think Carol just spotted it. But once the, um, the line speed finishes, now it's clear again. Well, so one, if you touch it, it becomes clear. Yeah. The interesting thing is I haven't touched it at all. No problem. No, but if you, if you touch it now, when it's unclear, I touched it and became clear. Okay, interesting. Because I have not moved the screen. Your your connection is okay. not. Your connection is bad. I think so, and I apologize. Um, you know what? Here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna stop sharing for a moment. Although we're at a one. Let me actually finish these two verses, and then I will unshare my screen, and then we'll reshare the screen and see if that helps at all. Okay? Perfect. Perfect. Okay, but I don't want to pause at this moment. Our couch is in a bower. Cedars are the beams of our house. Cypresses, the rafters. Wow. So unlike the king who's in the castle, you can tell they're out in nature. They have they have nature underneath them. They have nature over them. It's a beautiful nature scene. You can picture it in your mind, all these incredible trees. And for those of us like myself who are big nature people, it just brings you to that state of seeing just gorgeousness of God and creation and all that stuff. Um, so the king's in his castle on his couch, and this is our couch. We're nestled together you know, think of whether it's camping or being on the beach. You know, the modern scenes might be the, or the 50s scenes might be, you know, what was it? From here to eternity, I, was that the big beach scene? Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah. So um, those types of things, you're, the nature surrounding you and enveloping you and just being the two of you in nature. So gorgeous, gorgeous stuff. And then praising each other and comparing each other to both chariots and animals, right? Because the eyes were like doves. And we're going to keep seeing these types of imagery going on. And you're going to see that being in nature together on a regular basis. Okay. Any questions before we go on to the next text? Yes, George. Sorry about all the questions, but it strikes me that these verses have to do with the construction of the temple by Solomon because it refers to cedars and it refers to these things which were brought from Lebanon and um, dealing with my translation says tabernacle but I think that um, this these are again the relationship between God Solomon and the construction of the temple I think whether it has to deal with God we're going to be exploring throughout yes it certainly could be because if it's dealing with the tabernacle, then certainly we're dealing with our relationship with God on that level. And or it may just be talking about Solomon's greatness because Solomon did all the building. Um, and when you think about someone, when you talk about someone being as tall as, you know, we have our own expressions. Um, but a cedar tree is that stunning, tall, gorgeous that made sense that it was used for it. They were all, you know. And they're called cedars of Lebanon, and they also exist in Israel. Um, even though they're called cedars of Lebanon, that's the type of tree it is. And a lot of them were brought down from Lebanon. And also at this time, Solomon had the largest, when we talk, when some people talk about greater Israel, they're talking about the time period of King Solomon, who had the most land that included Lebanon, that included Jordan. So when you talk, when people start talking about greater Israel, which usually come from, if you're talking Israeli politics, they're usually going to lean very far to the right. Um, which is interesting. I did it this way so you could see it that way, but that's my left. Um, so there's a, so there's lots of different things that play into all of this as well. And, and the lenses that people use to look at the text, therefore, in modernity even, will depend on where they stand in terms of Judaism as well and Israeli politics, obviously, as well. Um, and we're not gonna go into Israeli politics today because we're gonna just stay on the level of love. And that's a much better place to be than politics of Israel, which may not have a lot of love involved right now. Um, hopefully we all have a relationship with Israel. That's a whole nother thing. Okay, so here we go. I'm gonna share my text again. Hopefully it will, work better and I have my optimizations on so any better this time yes yay see you just keep playing okay so my Hebrew name is Shoshana and Shoshana means both a rose and a lily so it is all throughout this and when we have the song Erev Shal Shoshanim, which especially if you know Israeli music, you know, there's Erev do, 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 and that's as much as you should hear me sing. Um, it's, it's one of the songs that's often used at weddings because it's that whole feeling of being surrounded by roses and lilies and it comes from all of this. Okay, so here we go. I am a rose of, Sh of Sharon, part of Israel, a lily of the valleys. Like a lily among thorns, so is my darling among the maidens. How beautiful. Like an apple tree among trees of the forest, so is my beloved among the youths. I delight to sit in his shade and his fruit is sweet to my mouth. So already you're hearing it going back and forth again. 
sometimes hard to follow until you get a pronoun. He brought me to the banquet room and his banner of love was over me. Sustain me with raisin cakes, refresh me with apples, for I am faint with love. Just, just beautiful stuff. His left hand was under my head, his right arm embraced me. I adjure you, O maidens of Jerusalem, by gazelles or by hinds of the field, do not wake or rouse love until it please. So you're going to see quite often these little breaks from them talking to each other, to her talking to the maidens of Jerusalem, whether they be her girlfriends or whatever. <clears throat> sometimes they're not positive, sometimes they are. But this beautiful statement of don't rush love, let it come in when it's ready to come in. Um, okay, so we continue on. So you can picture the embrace and everything else. And here we go. Hark, my beloved. There he comes, leaping over mountains, bounding over hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or like a young stag. There he stands behind our wall gazing through the window, peering through the lattice. My beloved spoke thus to me, arise my darling, my fair one, come away. For now the winter is past, the rains are over and gone. The blossoms have appeared in the land. The time of pruning has come. The song of the turtle. Green fragrance of all fragrance. My darling, my fair one, come away and pause there. Oh, and I get unstable again. Can you still see it? No, it's blurry. No, it's blurry. Okay, let me come out for a moment. Oh, it's okay. I came out for a moment. It will just be what it will be today. Right? We just deal with the technology we have at the moment. Yep. Um, this stuff is incredibly gorgeous, I think. Um, well, Susan, then, yes. Uh, before you launch it, it yes. might help the line speed if you literally uh, advance it a whole screen upward at a time, rather than every couple lines starting to shift the screen up and scroll okay. it up. That way, it's not recreating the whole screen every couple of lines. I will do my best to do that. You got it. Um, did anyone find that part familiar? Yes. Yeah. Okay, why was it familiar? The sound of the turtle dove. <laughs> okay. No, arise, my beloved. But I don't arise, my beloved. Where was that from? Where do you know it from? I can't remember. It's in many of the Haggadot for Passover. Oh. oh. <laughs> when we dip the karpas, when we dip the greens, when we're celebrating spring... Oh, yeah. Many of the Haggadot have that section in there oh, yeah. because it's a celebration of spring. And it's gorgeous biblical literature, biblical poetry. And it's talking about all these different nature, all these different animals. And it's stunning. And they're comparing each other back and forth to all these different animals. Right? And we're celebrating all the different things that are blooming including their love. So it is familiar. Um, it is also familiar, this is a section that there are lots of melody to Hebrew songs because of the gorgeousness of the <laughs> I have a pair of turtle and a little bit, once on we get gap. a little bit further, I'll actually play some more. Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Turtle doves are so fantastic. Okay, so let's see if it works better this time. We shall share again. We shall share again. George, what's your question? Um, again, uh, again, I, I'm sorry to bother with this translation, but well, then don't do it. <laughs> uh, it says, uh, "I warn you, O Nate, verse seven. I warn you, O nations destined to ascend to Jerusalem, for if you violate your oath, you will become as defenseless as gazelles 
or Heinz, I presume that's some kind of a deer, yes. dare to provoke God to hate me, I don't know who the me is, or to disturb God's love while, I guess the me is Israel, uh, or to disturb God's love for me, Israel, while God still desires it. Again, or it's Solomon. Very Zionist or a very nationalistic <laughs> translation that deals with um, the I thou relationship between perhaps God and Israel and the I it relationship so far between God and the other nations of the world. I would absolutely agree with everything there, George, except for their translation. I, 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 only, I don't know the Hebrew. <laughs> I, I understand. Um, this is, as I said, this is a text that does not mention God, except for maybe in one spot. It has one possibility, and it's a beautiful possibility. Their translation is so far from any chance of literal. Um, it's definitely from a certain point of view. It is a fascinating point of view, and I'm glad that you're sharing some of these things. It's not necessarily a point of view that I believe, but I just I want to bring a different text. I think it's fascinating, and it's always interesting to see how things are translated. Um, they are really playing with things because God is not mentioned in the Hebrew. They are, I mean, definitely they're playing with the language and other nations are not mentioned in this. So, uh, it, Which it, translation is that? It's that you said it was stone? Yes. Okay. okay. And that makes sense that it is. Um, stone and art school is definitely is religious Zionism. So it makes sense. Yeah. What is your translation? That same line that he read in my translation that I have in this no, one. Who, who translated this? This is JPS. This is the Jewish Publication Society. Um, I have many others. Um, and I could try to pull some off of other places. Um, for instance, I have one by Marsha Falk, and we're going to look at one of her lines later. Um, and I love looking at translations and how did they get to things. The one that George is sharing is not using the Hebrew language if for some of it. So I'm wondering how they did it. No, I'll call you back. Bye-bye. Okay. So now I'm going to move the screen because of the suggestion and because we wanted to, I wanted to see what, compared to what George was reading for us. Okay. So now, the part that I hadn't read yet from this one is, oh, my dove in the cranny of the rocks, hidden by the cliff, let me see your face. Let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet and your face is comely. Catch us the foxes, the little foxes that ruin the vineyards, for our vineyard is in blossom. My beloved is mine and I am his, whose browses among the lilies, when the day blows gently and the shadows flee, set out my beloved swift as a gazelle or a young stag for the hills of spices. Okay, so earlier we had Kumi Lach, and here we have Anila Dodiva Dodili, or Dodiliva Anilo. Um, so we have all those different things going on. This one specifically, we have Dodiliva Anilo Haroepa Shoshanim. Yes? George, did you say something? Now, I okay. think maybe people just want to make sure they mute if they have any other conversation. Okay, so I wanted to play with you because I created a little thing for us. Where did Spotify go? There we go. Okay, so some of these, so Dodi Lee, which I just talked about, Dodi Lee Vanilo Haroe, 
is often used in weddings. And it's actually the most popular wedding song. So I get, I wanted to sh share with you a couple different versions. And I actually have other songs in here as well that are all from what we just read from that one section in chapter two. So here we go. This is one version of Dodie Lee by Safam. Can anyone hear me? I can yeah. now. Yep. Okay. Did you hear the music or no? We hear yes. the music, yes. and not you. Okay. Fine. Okay. So that was one by Safam where they took where they talked about the wedding ceremony itself. They used the line that said when you present the ring to one another. And then they went directly into the Dodi Lee. Some of these others are gonna be probably more like the melodies that you know for Dodi Lee. No. Well, that's the jazz version, that will not be it. Try this. Did others hear it? No. Uh, I can okay. hear it. If, if you can, if you're moving your things around at all, especially the top of your laptop, please mute yourself first because we hear all the rustling. Okay. I'm going to therefore go away from the music. Sorry about that. But there are many, 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 many beautiful melodies. And what I will do um, later today on the on the synagogue's online learning site, I will add the link to the Spotify so you can hear the different melodies yourself. Um, okay, I am also adding on Spotify, hope, I, I'm also adding, if I can figure out how, I have a link, it's not a link, I have a document that um, I am going to try to figure out how to put on the Temple website so that, um, you can have all, I created a resource list of books that I used in prepping for this course so that that could be made available. I just have to figure out how we can do it rather than the regular links. Um, and then this material itself will also be up on the online learning page. Okay, so now we, come up to another beautiful one I think we've skipped a chapter we're up to chapter four and here we have ah you are fair my darling. ah you are fair your eyes are like doves behind your veil your hair is like the flock of goats streaming down Mount Gilead now most people may not want to have their hair compared to goats <laughs> <laughs> but the concept is is that it's flowing that as you see the goats jumping from rock to rock to rock, that it's curly, it's moving, it's waving. That's the kind of concept to picture there. Your teeth are like, this is a fascinating one. Your teeth are like a flock of ewes climbing up from the washing pool. All of them bear twins and not one loses her young. Your lips are like a crimson thread 
your mouth is lovely, your brow behind your veil gleams like a pomegranate split open. So if you've ever seen a pomegranate open, mm -hmm. you know, it has that white skin and in between the white skin is the pink mm -hmm. seeds. So, yep. pick, so it's like, it's giving you an imagery of lace over, over flesh, which is kind of pretty. <laughs> Your neck is like the Tower of David. So once again, we have these strong architectural comparisons. Built to hold weapons, hung with a thousand shields and the quivers of warriors. Your breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle, browsing among the lilies. When the day blows gently and the shadows flee, I will betake me to the Mount of Myrrh, to the hill of frankincense. Every part of you is fair, my darling. There is no blemish in you. From Lebanon, come with me. From Lebanon, my bride, with me. Trip down from Amana's peak, from the peak of Sinir and Hermon, from the dens of lions, from the hills of leopards. You have captured my heart, my own, my bride. You have captured my heart with one glance of your eyes, with one coil of your necklace. Good stuff. Then we move on to chapter five. I opened the door for my beloved, but my beloved had turned and gone. This actually seems like this happened often. So we're going to have, they're together. They had to separate. Something happened. They're together. Something happened. They had to separate. So I opened the door for my beloved, but my beloved had turned and gone. I was faint because of what he said. I sought, but found him not. I called, but he did not answer. I met the watchmen who patrol the town. They struck me. They bruised me. The guards of the walls stripped me of my mantle. I adjure you, O maidens of Jerusalem. If you meet my beloved, <clears throat> tell him this, that I am faint with love. So at times in Songs of Songs, we're going to see how those pillars of society, for instance, the watchmen, are not liking this relationship or not liking perhaps that she is strolling out at when she shouldn't be. For instance, like we saw with Dina. And yet here, She's struck down and bruised and stripped. And you got to wonder why one would treat someone like that. So it's not all perfect, but it has its moments. So we go on to better times again. My beloved is clear skinned and Rudy, preeminent among 10,000. His head is fine as gold. His locks are curled and black as a raven. His eyes are like doves by water courses, bathed in milk set by a brimming pool. His cheeks are like beds of spices, banks of perfume. His lips are like lilies, they drip flowing myrrh. His hands are rods of gold studded with beryl. His belly a tablet of ivory adorned with sapphires. His legs are like marble pillars set in sockets of fine gold. He is majestic as Lebanon, stately as the cedars. His mouth is delicious and all of him is delightful. Such is my beloved, such is my darling, O maidens of Jerusalem. So we had her described from head to toe and here we have him described from head to toe and back up to his mouth again. Just gorgeous stuff. Any questions so far? Any reactions? Uh, George has one. Yes. When it says my beloved is, my translation, my beloved is pure and purifies sin, that means is without having had any plague or any uh, sariah, sarar, um, I'm not going to get that right. Sarat, yeah. Sarat, yeah. Yes. Without being uh, contaminated, um, it is true and loyal and pure to God with free of sin. In other words, when you have 
um, pure skin, you are not subject to what we will call leprosy. Is so that a translation or a commentary? Um, a little bit of both. <laughs> not okay. because my, it says, my beloved is pure and purifies sin and is ready with vengeance to punish betrayers surrounded with myriad angels. So uh, I interpret that as being that you are um, not um, committed any kind of uh, transgression, such as um, lying or um, uh, idolatry or something that would take you out of the community. I can understand how you can come up with that with that translation. Once again, I don't know how they came up. With I that understand. I, I, I just find it intriguing to compare the two translations and put yes. it in some sort of historical context. Yes, and it's really interesting because JPS is a pretty, you know, it's used by everyone. So it's very interesting how very different this one it, that one is. You know, I mean. There are others that are known to be more creative in terms of the language and beautifying the language, like Fox or Alter or Falk. Um, but this one's really interesting this time, pulling things out of there, because God is really not in the text. Yeah. Well, thank you for your patience and um, um, allowing No, me. it's fascinating. I appreciate it. Okay, so chapter six, and we're not doing all the chapters and I'm pulling pieces from parts. Um, here is where we finally have Anila Lidodi Vidodi Li. Right? So many of you may have it in your rings or may have jewelry of this or may have it in your ketubah or may have an art piece that says this. I have a dreidel that actually says this. <laughs> um, <laughs> That is a beautiful, um, by one of my favorite art Jewish artists, that um, it sits on like a heart-shaped, but modern, contemporary, more creative heart-shaped piece uh, that has an Ila Dodi on it. It's a beautiful statement. I am my beloved and my beloved is mine. Um, this is used all the time to talk about couples, as we know, and is used at weddings and is so very often put on wedding invitations. I used a different line because I didn't want to be like everyone else. Um, and I guess maybe that was silly of me because my marriage didn't work. Um, and, um, I don't think it's because of the wedding invitations. I don't want anyone. <laughs> <laughs> and Anila Dodi Vidodi Li is, all, is because of the relationship that people say between Israel and God and how we're supposed to look at this as allegory is also used to talk about our relationship with God. I am that God is saying that supposedly God is saying, I am my beloved and my beloved is mine. I'm in this relationship with Israel and Israel's in this relationship with me. It is also because time is always preparing for many different things, even though Shavuot is in a week. Anila Dodi Vidodi Li, if you take the first letter of each of those words, you have Aleph Lamed Vav Lamed, which gives you the Hebrew month of Elul. Mm. Oh, wow. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. um, so it's specifically used in the month of Elul, Anila Dodi Vidodi Li, to remind us as we're preparing for the high holidays that we are in this special relationship with God and that we are in a beloved relationship with God. Mm -hmm. And how do we show our love to God and how do we return to God and how does God show God's love for us? So there's lots of cool things that are done because of that, that they play with all of this at that time. I've, I just wanted to say, I've always found that refreshing versus a God-fearing foundation yes. for religion. Yeah. And over and over and over again, I find myself saying how much I prefer this. I would agree with you. 
This this definitely fits more in my God concept. And as we get a little bit further, we'll get into even more so. And then I'll share some more thoughts by others and my own thoughts at the end as well. And you all hopefully will get to share some more of your own thoughts. Um, I think this is one of the... It, I think that this can be taken for all the different levels. And yes, if this is the level that we, when I talk about that the Tanakh represents so many different stories of our relationship with God, and that hopefully one of them in there can be fit into your God concept, this one certainly does for me. Um, it's a stunning one. Okay, so here we go back again. I am my beloved and my beloved is mine. He browses among the lilies or the roses, depending on how you want to translate your Shanim, because it's translated as both. You are beautiful, my darling, as Tirzah, comely as Jerusalem, awesome as bannered hosts. Turn your eyes away from me, for they overwhelm me. Your hair is like a flock of goats. We've seen that before, streaming down from Gilead. Your teeth are like a flow of ewes. We've seen this before, climbing up from the washing pool and all of them bear twins and not one loses her young. Your brow behind your veil like the pomegranate split open. There are 60 queens and 80 concubines and damnals without number. Only one is my dove, my perfect one, the only one of her mother, the delight of her who bore her, made and see and acclaim her, queens and concubines praise her. Who is she that shines through like the dawn? beautiful as the moon, radiant as the sun, awesome as bannered hosts. So when you think about Shakespeare, could be that Shakespeare got some of, the, of Shakespeare's ideas from right here. You know, Juliet being compared to the moon. Okay, Song of Songs, chapter seven. Once again, we have her talking to the maidens. Turn back, turn back, O maid of Shulam. Turn back, turn back, that we may gaze upon you. Why will you gaze at the Shulamite in the Mahanaim dance? So once again, questioning herself. How lovely are your feet in sandals? Can you imagine getting that compliment? <laughs> no. No. I mean, women love, I shouldn't stereotype. Many women love shoes. Most women never get a compliment about their feet in the shoes. Right. right. Okay, as much as, but we compliment each other usually, but it's not the feet itself. Um, right. How lovely are your feet in sandals, O oh daughter of nobles. Your rounded thighs are like jewels, the work <laughs> of a master's hand. Your navel is like a round goblet. Let mixed wine not be lacking. Your belly like a heap of wheat hedged ab about with lilies. I mean, it's very interesting. Your breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle. Your neck is like a tower of ivory. Your eyes like pools of cheshbon by the gate of Beit Rabin. Your nose like the Lebanon tower. How about that one? <laughs> <laughs> And faces towards Damascus. So once again, so here we have the reverse. Remember, I said it's either head to toe or toe to head. Well, that was so cool. Sorry, I got distracted. A hummingbird just sat on my windowsill. Um, that was so cool. Okay, sorry. Um, and perfect for what we're studying right now. Okay, I love it. Um, so we have this whole description of her once again in nature. And, but this time toe to head. A little bit further. I am my beloved's and his desire is for me. Come my beloved, let us go into the open. Let us lodge among the henna shrubs. Let us go early to the vineyards. Let us see if the vine has flowered, if its blossoms have opened, if the pomegranates are in bloom. So everything should be in bloom while your love is in bloom. There I will give my love to you. By the way, that was the part that we used for my wedding invitation. There I will give oh, my love to you. Nice. The mandrakes, the magic mandrakes. We've studied the mandrakes before. 
the, with Rachel and Leah, the mandrake mm -hmm. yield their fragrance. And our doors are all choice fruits, both freshly picked and long stored. Have I kept my beloved for you? Okay. We come now to, in my opinion, the best of the best. <laughs> if only it could be, okay, not this first part, because this first part is odd. Okay. <laughs> Just going to put that out there. Loving and odd. If only it could be as with a brother, as if you had nursed at my mother's breast, then I could kiss you when I met you in the street and no one would despise me. Okay, kind of weird. I think. Kind of beautiful, <clears throat> kind of odd. But there, right? there weren't public displays of affection amongst lovers right so you can hug your brother exactly and him, you know so i get that oh as i said very understandable and a bit odd to wish that your lover was your brother <laughs> yes so it has you know, <laughs> when you when you and it continues and i would lead you i would bring you to the house of my mother of her who taught me I would let you drink of the spiced wine of my pomegranate juice. Okay. This may be euphemistic. Probably is. His left hand was under my head, his that of the pomegranate juice. Pomegranates are often used to symbolize the female. Mm. His right, you know, his right hand caressed me. I adjure you, O maidens of Jerusalem. So here the maidens are again. So I'm guessing George has a unique translation again. <laughs> Do not wake or rouse love until it please, which on one level is just meant to say, don't rush its time and let us be able to love when we want to love. Who is she who comes up from the desert leaning upon her beloved? Under the apple tree, I roused you. Okay, so tying back to other things, although we don't know if it was an apple tree. It was there your mother conceived you. There she who bore you conceived you. Okay, so you have talking about both mothers because it's wanting to know each other from the day you were born, which is just stunning stuff. So now we're coming to the verse. Ready? Yep. By the way, George, did you have a strange translation for four? I'm going to guess not since I'm not hearing from you. Okay. This is apparently, this is the at least the third time we have in, the te in your text um, the reference to maidens of Jerusalem. Yes. Um, We've seen it before, and in my text, it is nations of the world that are being worried, that are being warned. And um, so again, it's that same parallelism, perhaps, that is going on throughout, at least, um, again, who's having the relationship with God? Is it the daughters of Jerusalem, presumably the Israelites, or the other nations of the world because um, oh, nations who are destined to ascend to Jerusalem. Okay. If you dare to provoke God to hate me, Israel, again, it's the same repetition yeah. of the loyalty Got it. God and Israel that is at least in my translation. Okay. And on in this level, it's really just talking to her friends, you know, it's just saying, don't rush love, let it come when it comes. It's such a very different warning. And, and I'm not even sure I would use the word warning. So it's interesting. Okay, so here's my favorite line. And I did many a paper, I did a major paper on this one line. Let me be a seal upon your heart, like the seal upon your hand. 
for love is as fierce as death. Passion is mighty as Sheol. Its darts are darts of fire, a blazing flame. Okay, so let me break this down into different parts. Let me be a seal upon your heart. Where have we seen seal before? And Tamar. Judah and Tamar. Excellent. Right? She took his seal oh. and later showed it to him. And he developed from that. So on one level, it brings us back to that story. And that's what validates the relationship or the document or whatever it is being, um, the seal is being put upon. Um, right. That's another thing, right? So let me be a seal upon your heart. Let me, let me always be there. Let me be a part of you. And let you always be thinking of me because I'm right there, right? We talk about those things all the time. There's a lot of love songs, these, especially from the 50s that have that type of symbolism. Let, like this, okay, like the seal upon your hand, because we know that the seal was actually that ring. And then it says, for love is fierce as death. That love is as strong as death itself. Not that it's going to bring you back from death, right? So it's not that story of, oh, my son would be so embarrassed that I'm blanking on this moment. What is it? It's not our, 